All right, Andrew's on whether curfews work. It's not for me to prove. That's right. He doesn't have to prove it. You know what? Daniel Andrews doesn't need to prove anything because he has revolutionary conviction. When Fidel Castro overthrew the Cuban government, he didn't have any need for a courtroom. He didn't have any need for due process. He had revolutionary conviction and he just knew who were enemies of the revolution and who were friends. Those who were enemies were lined up and shot. Yep, no need for a jury. Revolutionary conviction trumps due process. It trumps all democratic principles, actually. So that maybe that's why Daniel Andrews said what he said. Anyway, let's have a little bit of a look at that because Daniel Andrews, I mean, this man is just an absolute walking joke and we need to be able to laugh at him. Is that fair enough? Who here finds the appearance of Daniel Andrews funny? The things he says, I sure as hell don't take him seriously. So we may as well use him as a source of humor during these very dark days that we're living in. Who here agrees with that? Say I. All right, so what do we have here? What's he up to this time? Daniel Andrews, huh? Took a three month holiday, gave himself a nice pay rise. He's on what, $450,000 a year. And um, he certainly meets the criteria of what Wayne Gatt described in that article, didn't he? He, he certainly meets the criteria. Um, those who view themselves as more important, too blinded by self-importance to ever, ever appreciate or care about the hardships and the heartache suffered by people they don't know. Wayne Gatt, Wayne Gatt has like 100% nailed it. He described Daniel Andrews. It's incredible. I mean, there you go. It's uh, you know, it really is these sort of things. It makes you, it makes you think. Wow, maybe there's something going on. Anyway, anyway, what does this article say in relation to the curfew? Asked to justify the curfew in light of comments from epidemiologists, including the Doherty Institute's Jody McVernon and ANU's Peter Collinan, that they had not seen evidence proving such rules curb the spread of coronavirus. Mr. Andrews said, "It is not for me to prove the efficacy of any one measure." That's right. He doesn't have to prove the extent to which keeping children out of the playgrounds is going to save our community. He doesn't have to prove <laughs> whether or not locking people in their home and depriving them of sunlight and exercise. He doesn't have to prove if that works in the best interest of public health. He doesn't need to prove anything. He has revolutionary conviction. He's smart. You're not. Therefore, shut up. Don't ask any questions and simply bend at the knee to a man who I would consider to be the most unhinged maniac in Victorian political history. But guess what? It's not going to work, is it? Daniel Andrews, uh, he's trampled on our rights. He has picked a fight. He can not win. So what did, he, what did he go on to say here? He said, but let me be clear about, you know, the shocking impingement on people's human rights. Ah, oh, he's being condescending. Like it means you can't go shopping in the middle of the night. It means you can't go and do, oh, whatever, Daniel Andrews. Daniel Andrews, you're a fool. Nobody cares what you have to say. Enjoy your days in office because they're severely numbered. And I have a feeling that the time will come when perhaps you won't have a job. And I think Daniel Andrews, for the record, may have burnt his bridges with the Chinese Communist Party. He was in their good books for a long time, remember? Traveling to China all the time. You know, they'd roll out the red carpet. They'd make him feel very special. And Daniel Andrews, it has such an inflated sense of self-importance. He's so arrogant that I have no doubt that he actually believed that he was as special as what the people from the Chinese Communist Party made him out to be. But I can guarantee you when Daniel Andrews went to China and negotiated the Belt and Road Agreement and negotiated deals that were essentially designed, in my view, to sell off our sovereignty, the minute he would leave the room from those, uh, those meetings, now this is my opinion, of course, I can almost guarantee you that the guys in the Chinese Communist Party would just burst out laughing, giving each other high fives, probably saying things like, we can't believe how stupid this Australian guy is selling out his own country so we can advance our agenda. You know, Daniel Andrews to the Chinese Communist Party is the type of person that Stalin would have referred to as a useful idiot. That's right. All right, so Melbourne COVID-19 curfew is pointless, say police and experts. So if it's pointless, will police enforce it? If the police are willing to enforce pointless directions, what else are they willing to enforce? That's a, that's a question for you at home. So there he is there. So it's pointless. What we know is that last year, uh, it was challenged in court. Look at this. This was published uh, by the Australian October 1st, 2020 coronavirus. No evidence of curfew in isolation would be effective, court told. All right. So 
we, uh, we actually see it happening all over again. Look at this. Melbourne's new curfew heading for the courts. We saw it last year. We're seeing it again. What do you think is going to happen? I'm just going to read to you the first paragraph right here. I never really hold out much hope when I see these types of uh, court challenges, but it is good to obviously challenge the tyranny. It says, when Premier Daniel Andrews imposed this week's curfew on Melbourne, barrister Vanessa Plain started receiving phone calls. Within days, it was clear that the curfew, like its predecessor, was heading for courts. Do you think the curfew was lawful? I mean, to me, it kind of feels like we're all on house arrest, that we've been determined guilty without any presumption of innocence, and we've all been locked in our own homes. Well, Daniel Andrews, uh, drinking the top shelf alcohol, remember that? Remember that statement he made, I'm going to move up the shelf tonight? And he posted that disgusting picture on his social media with an expensive bottle of alcohol, whilst Victorians, many Victorians, were losing their livelihoods. This man is just an absolutely horrible human being. And in my view, completely lacks any type of decent character. He shouldn't be in power. He shouldn't be in power. And you know what? That raises much deeper questions. What did we do to deserve a leader like Daniel Andrews? We must have done something. I believe in cause and effect. I do believe that, I, I believe, say, in the law of attraction, that uh, the actions that we engage in will inevitably lead to some type of outcome. Could it be maybe that we were too busy watching the AFL, watching Married at First Sight, too busy uh, in our own lives pursuing our careers that we completely ignored politics and we allowed these self-serving people to get elected and re-elected time and time again and then we wake up one day and realize that the vast majority of people who work within the walls of, of our parliaments care way more about preserving and advancing their own careers than they do about the um, well-being and human rights of 25 million Australians. What do you think it is? How did we get here? I'm not sure exactly how we got here, but what I do know is that it is the responsibility of we the people to fix it, okay? We have to take responsibility for this whether you want to or not, because if we don't take responsibility, then we're doomed, okay? So it may not be your fault that we're here. It may not be my fault, but it's sure as hell our responsibility to do everything we can to to correct it, right? And to uh, reshift at the course of uh, destiny for our country. Who here agrees with that statement?